So welcome again to The Property Show. I'm Matt Turner. Hope you had a great week and good to be speaking with you again. Um, Today I'm going to be talking to Peter Petru, a London-based accountant, um, about tax implications essentially uh, when you're buying and uh, I suppose selling property. Um, the marketplace later on in the show, I talked to Robert Evans of Property Wealth Management. Um, Robert manages properties. When you uh, have a property and you're going to let it out, he looks after them um, in, a, in a slightly different way to the standard estate agent. So that'd be uh, uh, worthwhile listening to. Great, so um, I'm joined today by a, um, a top accountant in London. Um, a lot of people, when, I'm, when they're buying, obviously they ask me for uh, surveyors or mortgage brokers, but quite often they actually forget um, to work out their own tax structure and what implications buying a property in London uh, is going to have on them. Um, so hi Pete, how are you? Hi Matt, very well indeed, thank you. Very, very good. So um, yeah, Pete, I mean obviously you've uh, been an accountant for some years now and you must have seen a lot of property investments uh, being made and sold in, in London. Um, I mean, what's your, how are you seeing the property market in general at the moment? Well, it's uh, an unusual market. We have obviously the uh, Brexit hangover. We don't the, B, know the B word, we don't like to use that one, yeah. Um, <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen with that. I must say from a my perspective, we haven't really felt anything on the Brexit um, at the moment. We've still seen a lot of foreign investment. Foreign yeah. investment seems to be propping up uh, the uh, the industry, the market. Um, we, we certainly have seen a lack of supply. Prices are still quite high. I get clients come up to me and ask me for bargains. Don't seem to be many bargains around. I think there's still... Those are the clients you refer to me when they're out there. Yeah, something like that. But, um, you know, there is a lot of unrealistic expectation between both buyers and sellers, and it's it's about finding that equilibrium. Um, Certainly the buy-to-let industry has changed, I would say, in the last few years. It tends to have moved away from the dabbler to more professional landlords Mm -hmm. who... who, um, who have found a lot of difficulties, I must say, with funding. I mean, the funders have been very, very difficult and slow in assisting um, the property industry generally. Uh, compliance is the bane of our life in, 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 all, in all sectors, actually, yeah, yeah. but in particular property. I mean, I've had situations, I've got one right now, actually, where it's taken us six months to finalise the compliance side. I mean, the banking side was done in a month and a half, valuations, okay. etc., Actually, going through compliance, particularly with foreign investors, has been very, very difficult, and it, it, it's very frustrating, to, to say the least. So, finding good funders is of paramount importance. Is that just a sort of uh, you know the, the the right documents for the bank, or is it more of a government legislation? Sort well, of I just think or? banks are being very, very cautious. I mean, we've got okay. the whole money laundering, the KYC um, sort of. Uh, requirements of the banks and they just take it to the nth degree mm-hmm. and it, it's it's frustrating because if you get a, 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 a you know, misspelling of a name Gets you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a two week wait common sense doesn't, doesn't no, really no common sense doesn't it's, all, it's all tick box do, do you think then I mean obviously banks are saying that they're lending but are they you know they're, maybe they're not actually wanting to lend to a lot of people they want uh, a lot of you know, more security than they Matt, I'll, I'll be honest with you, in, in terms of the banks, it's very much um, the, a trend or a fad. It depends what mood you get them in to a certain extent. Okay. If it's something that they like, they're very enthusiastic. If it's something they don't like, they drag their heels. And, and I don't think um, the relationship you have with, a, with your bank is that important anymore. Yeah. It's literally a checklist. Does it fit our very, very tight criteria? If it doesn't, it doesn't matter if we've done 20 deals with you or none, they'll say no. It's, it's, a red flag somewhere along the way. Very road. much so. And that's very frustrating because when I was uh, starting off, it was all about getting good relationships, yeah. particularly with the banks. And I don't think that's relevant now. Does that, does that mean that bankers don't like going out for lunch anymore? Is that what you're trying to say? It's yeah? something like that. I think, <laughs> I think the lunch is still quite important for them, but not as important as it was. No, for sure. Um, obviously, you mentioned buy to let. Uh, obviously, the big change. Uh, I think it was April two thousand and sixteen. The, the uh, additional three uh, percent um, for the second home purchase. Right. I mean, has have you seen? Uh, well, there's two that aspects effect? to that. I mean, with regards to the buy to lets now, um, the private individual has now or is going to lose the interest relief 
uh, in 2021 so that you cannot claim all the interest that you pay as a deduction of on your rental income. That's which just the mortgage that you're that yes, got, that's right. Yeah. So that that's a real downer, uh, and we've now uh, adv- we are now advising, and clients are, are a bit more savvy. They are tending to come to us with buy to let propositions, and straight away going into limited companies instead of you know instead Matt of, Turner buying in Matt Turner's name. Absolutely, it's, it's, it'll be ABC Limited from now on. Okay, and that's the right way to do it. And that 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 is that has several um, good things. Number one. Um, obviously, the interest relief is fully allowable in the company. Secondly, um, corporation tax rates are paid at 19% of profits, um, which is at, which is going down to 17% in 2020. So these are, are, are very important um, advantages in going to a company. The the three percent uh, stamp duty. I mean, when we, again when I started off, stamp duty was a fairly negligible uh, yeah, yeah. tax. Now it certainly has to be factored into all costs, um, and that's where I think the professional landlord, the professional buy to letter, if I call him that, is coming in and 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 being a bit more, shall we say, savvy on the overall cost of investment because mm-hmm. it's quite chunky. Yeah, it's quite yeah. chunky. I mean, the plus three has come in, and if I can just quickly talk to you about that, yeah, please. It's one of those things when we're. I mean, we recently uh, ha- had a, a networking evening, and uh, one of the the uh, topics of discussion was this three percent, and it, and it's a little bit confusing because where 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 does the three percent tax come in, or the plus three percent tax yeah. come in? Um, so that I can simplify it as much as I can. If you are a private individual and you own your own home, for example, and you go to buy a second property, whatever the stamp duty rate is, because obviously stamp duty is on a scale, depending on the value of the property, if you buy that second property, there will be a plus 3% tax charge. That will happen also with a married couple or a couple uh, in a civil marriage. They will always pay the 3% plus on their second property. And that's the case if Matt Turner owns a property, then Matt Turner Limited, the limited company, buys it. I'm paying Correct. the 3% on the, that as companies well. Companies so always no, pay. No. Yeah, companies always pay yeah. the plus three. So we're really talking at the moment about individuals. So the, the, the rule is now is if you buy a second property in which you intend to live in, you have 36 months. It used to be 18 months. Now it's 36 months to sell your first property, you will need to pay the plus three uh, percent tax, yeah. stamp duty tax, yeah. on the second property. But as long as you sell it within the 36 months, you can make a reclaim of the plus three on the second property. But, yeah. Those are basic, the basic examples. We have got situations, for example, um, I had one recently where um, one of my clients wanted to buy a property. He already had a property and he wanted to buy it jointly with uh, a friend of his who hadn't had a property okay, at all. Yeah. Now, in that situation, because one of the parties has an existing property, the plus three is relevant. Mm-hmm. So even though the second person didn't have a property, never had a property, it is relevant. Um, we get some questions asked about that and it, it, it can be confusing. The, the, the last example I want to give is that if you have a couple who are not married, they can buy a property each and not pay the 3% because they're not tied, if I can call it. So if my that. girlfriend keeps pushing me to get married, I'll say, well, you know, obviously, honey, you're going to buy your own property. Let's, let's wait. Absolutely. Yeah? <laughs> wait, wait to do that and then think about it later. <laughs> now, this isn't going out on Valentine's Day, so I'll, I'll, I'll get away with that Thank one. goodness for that. Um, I mean, obviously, with that, that's, you know, the second property to me was always, always sort of is like a, a pension, you know, and... and Obviously, with the state pension in in the UK, it's not exactly great. You're not going to be able to uh, buy many loaves of bread on it. And um, I'm not a big fan of of actual pensions. It's quite dissuasive, really, isn't it? Do you think that 3%? Um, Yes. I mean, obviously, more costs will dissuade any potential investor. In saying that, again, maybe the old-fashioned side of me says, well, I've I've got a, a, a long experience in property. And over the years, property has been very faithful to me, very good to me. So, 
I'm very, I'm very much have a bias of, of on property. I, I believe in things that I can control, that um, I have experience with, and um, that's a side which will, will never change. And I think a lot of um, old-fashioned investors and even young kids now, even you know, that their, their desire is to get on the property ladder. Mm-hmm. They yeah. don't think about funds and investments and bitcoins and things like that. It's all very, very trendy to talk about over a drink, but really. Everyone wants to get onto the housing ladder, and that's still very much at the forefront of most of the people that I I know and I work with. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, obviously, you mentioned um, about international buyers. I mean, are they, you know, the tax implications for, for them? Is that similar to you know Matt Turner, the UK resident, or how's that? There's been a lot of changes over the last few years, actually. Um, I have a number of, uh, should we say, non-resident landlords, and it was very easy. In the old days, uh, you'd buy a property, and uh, the rents, you would pay profit, so a tax on the profit on your rents. But if you sold it, there was never any capital gains. Okay. Well, over the last few years, there have been some significant changes to the international buyer's taxation position and I'll quickly go through yeah, two or three of the things that have happened. I mean first of all we have the, we have something called an annual tax on envelope dwellings which is, which is ATED for short uh, and basically what that is is that, that it, it, depending on the value of a residential property you will need to pay tax based on the value if it is unlet and you mm-hmm. will have to do a return every year by the 30th, 30th of April each year to confirm the status of that property. Is that just the government trying to, you know, I suppose in their eyes, help the high housing crisis that it's not empty, that they can rent it out? I mean, what's the, the uh, or was it just a tax I, I, on I, I think it's more that the, well, this is again my opinion here, but sure. I think it's more that uh, for a number of years, the international landlord hasn't had paid his fair share okay. of taxes and has really made a lot of gains untaxed. Okay. And I think it's more to equalise the redress the balance and make things a bit fairer with the UK uh, the UK landlord. I mean, the second thing that's happened, and this happened in 2015, is that uh, non-resident landlords are now having to pay capital gains tax. Uh, it's quite complicated, and um, we've had a number of um, faux pas with uh, clients in that now, if you sell a property, you have to, within 30 days of the conveyance, uh, c- uh, you have to pay the tax and also send a return in. Okay. Uh, a number of clients and even a number of solicitors who aren't familiar with the rules have, have filed late returns and we've had a number of occurrences of penalties that have come through. Um, and that's something that, that we need to educate our clients. The, um, ca- the calculation of the CGT is a little bit complicated because there's different rates, whether it's an ATED related CGT or a non ATED related CGT. So we, we do get involved in the calculations of those because of the perceived complexity, um, and in particular things like valuations, we need to get values on certain dates. So there's a new era now of, 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 of a tax paying international investor. I mean, the final thing that I want to talk about, which is a fairly new, in other words, it's this tax year, is that finally the non-DOMs are paying, having to pay inheritance tax okay. on UK situ properties. So in the past, if a, um, if a client had a property in an offshore company, which is something that was quite common, and um, they died, well, it wouldn't form part of UK inheritance tax because they were non-DOMs mm-hmm. and they didn't pay the tax. Well now, as of April 17, if you have a UK situated property, irrespective of whether you're DOM or non-DOM, you will pay inheritance tax. So this year, actually, we've been doing a lot of um, planning, uh, mitigating uh, those types of taxes uh, for the non for the non doms and the non reses, so That's they're coming to talk. Pretty, to us. pretty complicated every situation. It, it then, is it? a little bit. It's quite bespoke as well. Um, as I say before, it was very much do the tax return on the rents, and that was it. Mm-hmm. Now you've got two or three other uh, potential taxes that the non resident landlord 
has to come and talk to us about. And that's one area where I would say, as an accountant, it's an area where we've really tried to push and educate the non-resident landlord. They're abroad. They, yeah. Oh, yeah, they they're, sure, all they're yeah. worried about is renting their property. They don't factor in the... Well, some, some of them probably won't even come to the UK. Yeah. They'll be at a Correct. property show in you know Singapore or something, Absolutely. and they buy a three off plan, and you know they don't actually it's not built yet. And then once it is, they're uh, suddenly getting all this paper where they didn't know that. Uh, yeah, I mean that's absolutely right, Matt. Uh, I mean, you know, bless the clients. Sometimes they, they do that. I mean, they sound like great buyers. Yeah, well, they're, they're brilliant. <laughs> Mr. Buyers. Estate agent would be very happy with that. Yeah, they are brilliant buyers, but we you know we have a responsibility to those, and mm-hmm. we we regularly send out newsletters and keep advo- informing them of the changes in legislation. And I think that's where the proactive accountant gets quite a few brownie points, making sure there's there's good knowledge and uh, good planning in place mm-hmm. for those type of investors. Um, you mentioned of the A tip. What values, uh, you know, does it, if you okay, if you could buy a hundred thousand pound property in London, is that uh, that comes starts to that? From, what, starts from five hundred thousand okay. and, and rises from five hundred thousand. So anything under five hundred thousand doesn't fall within the scope. So okay. um, you know, the, the small investor doesn't have to doesn't have to. And if you've got it let, then it, and it's or it's occupied. Then if it's, it's let, there is a relief. So all you need to do is just do a return and and state that it's let. Yeah. There's no tax on it. So again, there's a, a regulatory or compliance issue there. So um, or tax compliance, I should say, rather than regulatory, but nothing for less than five hundred thousand mm-hmm. values. Okay. I mean, obviously, we we touched on it at the beginning. You've uh, obviously worked in. You know, in London, most of, of your life. I mean, what what changes have you seen to the property market? Can you think of just? Uh, um... it, it, London is um, quite solid. I mean, I, I get to I get to work abroad, and I and I see the um, variations in property prices. Uh, London is quite stable, particularly central London. I'd say five miles around the radius radius around Oxford Circus, if I call it that. You tend to find, in my experience, that the prices are either going up. Or, or fairly level. I, I've not really seen any drops in prices um, over the years, and I'm, and I'm talking 20, 25 years. That they've been fairly, fairly solid, and and I think that also shows in in the foreign investor. The foreign investor likes central London. Once you go to a little bit of the outer zones on the underground, it, it's it, it's a little bit too far for them. They don't know those areas, and you know there, there is a little bit of persuasion if from the developers, say, who are looking to sell these type of properties um, in, in, in the location. So location is always going to be the, the most important thing for these types of investors. But London has been very, very stable. And um, you know, a lot of my clients have made very, very substantial gains. But you've got to hold your investments. Mm-hmm. You can't, there isn't that flipping um, yeah. principle, uh, I, I think, if I were making a general rule of things, if, you, if you're looking to sell less than three years, you won't really feel the benefit of the gain. Three to five years is where I feel that's the rough rule of thumb of where you're going to get your gains. Yeah, so no, no quick fix. And I suppose it's more prudent now with, obviously, the additional taxes. Absolutely. You know, you, you, there's a, you know, it's hard to find that deal out there. So, yeah, if you're holding on to a property for a long, not long, you should be able to surf the market. And uh, Correct. I mean, stamp duty has really... Um, hit the short-term gain uh, out, out and, and taken it out of, the, out of the equation, generally speaking. So I think again, you know, your investors, your the property people need to look at, look at their investments in a more medium-term rather than a short-term strategy. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I mean, would you, you know, would like to see any changes to the property market at all? I mean, do you buy and sell yourself? Is there anything that you uh, get frustrated with, or is there any? Anything that's well, as I've alluded to, Matt, the, the, you know, the banks are mm-hmm. very rigid in their policies. You know, it's you know, you might have the best credit rating, but it, they just are very slow, very slow, and very documenting. They want documentation and everything. It, it, it can be very, very laborious. I think also things like um, simplifying the buying and selling process. I mean, you must get this all the time in your field. It can be a little bit difficult. I mean, gazumping is an example. I mean, you must have heard this a million yeah. times. I mean, I've no idea why there aren't sort of laws on, 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 on people gazumping. And you know, it, it's very unfair. I, I had a situation when I bought my daughter's flat a number of years ago, and we were literally playing tennis with, with, with the 
with the value of the property, and it you know it was very very frustrating because it was it was literally the the agent you know playing us off on each other. I mean, it was ridiculous against another buyer. Yeah, as against another okay. buyer. So, I think the simplification of the process, particularly from my side, the one that I had more experience on, is the finance side. If there was a way that the, the finance side of it could be simplified. That would make life a lot easier. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, the, 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 the frustration I find with finance is that you know you can go to a bank or a mortgage broker and you give them your rough details and they're like, yeah, for sure, you can go and borrow, I don't know, four hundred thousand, and you think, oh, great. So then you go out and you go looking for a property, and then once you match that property to the mortgage, then obviously Mr. Underwriter and other people that you never get to speak to on the phone start looking into your case, and before you know it, um, you've hit a nail on the head. Then. They're emailing you with. You know, all sorts of documents, right? So it's absolutely. I mean, you start off feeling very, getting warm feeling from your, your brokers, and then all of a sudden, this, <laughs> this 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 two page email comes back with all requirements, and you're thinking, well, why don't you ask for that in the first place? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, so obviously, touch on buying for your your family. Do you, do you invest yourself in London as well? Or? Yes, yes. I mean, I've invested uh, on, on on a few uh, buy to lets. You know, I I like I like property. I do like property, um, residential property, I should say. It's it's something that is needed for a, a balanced investment. I think uh, we certainly, as a as a family, only look at medium to longer term investment strategies. We are definitely not in the short term flip uh, yeah. market. We don't know it. It involves you know making sure that you you, you spend a lot of money on on high good quality spec and having ready buyers on the other side. Uh, we tend to buy to hold. Yeah, It's uh, a, a safer way of, of doing it. It's where you can extract the, the, the best values, in my opinion. Obviously, looking at the, the location of the property, I think my experience is that having a good team around you, making sure that your agent, I mean, I've used you, as you know, on, on uh, a keep couple talking, of my Pete, property. Keep talking, of course, <laughs> of course, you know that I've used you. So, you know, and actually using people like yourself who can make the process a lot simpler. And it was, it was incredibly simple, actually, uh, the actual buying process. Using good agents, and you know as well as I do, there are some good ones and there's some not so good ones. If you get the good ones, it's it's a it's a real easy way of making good medium to long term investments. Okay. So yes, I'm a I'm a big fan. No, yeah, no, for sure. I guess we all, we all play. I always say it, we all, all play Monopoly as kids, and uh, <laughs> we're just we're playing it in the real world, right? Um, so obviously Nicholas Peters, how long? Uh, I mean, how did you? Uh, how, how long have you been working here? This is your your company, aren't you? Yes, actually, I set it up about twenty years ago. In fact, I'll probably invite you next year to one of my my twentieth anniversary party. Actually, right, I've just got a free uh, ticket yeah. for lunch. So there's, there's no such thing as a free lunch. No, maybe. never, never, never. <laughs> uh, but yes, I set it up in 1998. Um, where there's sixteen of us, we're a very happy office. We work hard together. Um, we care about our clients. I guess when I started off, I wanted to be my own boss. Yeah. And uh, the other thing that I really wanted, coming from a, a, a big firm background, I wanted to feel that I was helping people. And it might sound a bit a religious cult, but it wasn't. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like that at all. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make a difference. And I remember my first client. I met him in Sainsbury's, and he couldn't borrow money from anyone to buy his boss's uh, business, who was unfortunately dying of cancer at the time. He came and saw me, we set things up. And 20 years later, he's very successful. He's got a beautiful million pound house, foreign investments. And he's he's a really happy man. And uh, you know, he's been very loyal to me, I've been very loyal to him. And it just is very inspiring to see people uh, yeah, prosper with a little bit of help that we have. That's the reward inside of business, Absolutely. isn't it? Right, you're not just uh, a number. Um, Absolutely. So that's, no, fantastic. So um, obviously the listeners are going to be, uh, you've got some great information out there today. How can they get in contact with you? Uh, sort of your website? Yes, I mean, my website is uh, www.nicholas-peters.com. Um, we are very happy to talk to people uh, on a general basis. We don't um, charge by the minute. Um, that's not how we do it. We work on. I'm not being charged for this, Pete. No, I'm not. It's okay today. Although, yeah. although I might, I might have to get you to take me out to lunch soon because um, I'm hungry. Uh, but uh, no, we, we, we offer a, a, a 30 minute introductory 
chat, if I call it that, to just see what kind of things we can do to help the cl our clients. Sometimes we can't help the client, but I think um, being on tap to answer general queries and putting people in the right direction is something we're very happy to do. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very, obviously, as you've invested in property and you obviously know that side of things, it, you know, I think it's, you know, you can speak to you know, some accountants who don't buy into property and they won't understand your uh, individual needs. So I think that's probably where you're, you know, really ahead of the game now. Well, I've got over 20 years experience. I like to think I know a little bit about property. Um, I don't know everything about property, but I certainly know a lot, especially in the London area. I know some of the ways of, um, of uh, assisting the process. Uh, ways of what we need to present to finance institutions to make your life easier. As I said, it can be very, very difficult. You need to be a bit prepared, and that's something that we can definitely help with. It's an area of, of a speciality for us, property. I mean, we've always had property from day one. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose actually one point on there is, you know, like we said earlier on, it's not a case of taking the bank manager to lunch anymore, but it's as it's more documents, you can really help the client get their documents in order in the right way because you probably know how the banks actually want that. So that's something that you could really I mean, assist with. That's right. I mean, let, having trouble. Let, let, let me explain. I mean, with the changes in the taxation system, I think getting the structure right is really, really important at the outset. As we said before, um, interest relief is fully allowable on companies. So generally speaking, on the buy-to-let market, you form companies, and there you need to think about, you know, do I use my spouse? Do, my, do I use my adult kids? Is there a consideration later on with inheritance tax? Because obviously, you know, if you, if you die and you have a UK property, it, it will be under an inheritance tax charge. If you can diversify by having more shareholders, obviously you, you can use their inheritance tax bill rate bans, and make life a lot easier for you in terms of a planning point of view. Obviously then going to a bank with multiple shareholders means the bank's got to do due diligence on more than one person. So we need to make sure that when we approach the banks on behalf of clients, they are fully aware of the setup. We assist them with the standard documentation which we know they need. And it just then makes life a lot easier for the, the borrower. No, that's brilliant. Thank, well, Pete, that's uh, well, Peter Petru of uh, Nicholas Pieces and Co. Thanks for very much for joining us today, and, and uh, maybe we'll come back and uh, do another show once we uh, we get the budget out of the way. I'd be delighted. Thank you very much. Mate. Thanks very much. Thank you. You're listening to the Property Show with Matt Turner of Astute Property Search. If you have any property-related questions that you would like to ask Matt, you can email him at matt, with two t's, at astutepropertysearch.co.uk. The Marketplace with Matt Turner of Astute Property Search, showcasing different areas of London to live or invest in. Okay, so today um, the marketplace is a little bit different. Obviously, we normally go and focus on one area of uh, London. Um, today, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, Robert Evans joining me. He has a company called Property Wealth Management, which uh, specialise in looking after your uh, properties once you've uh, purchased them. Now, this is quite often a, a thing. You know, I, I sell properties to international investors, and then they'll go back to their own country and think, "Well, how am I going to get that property let?" And more importantly. How, who's going to look after it? You know, if you're living overseas, quite a long way away, um, you're going to need a, a, a professional uh, doing this. Um, so yeah, I'll just say hello. Hi, Robert. How are you doing? Hello, Matt. How are you? Very good, thank you. Um, so I've known Robert quite a while now. Um, so maybe have a little chat about yourself. You've been working in property for a few years, haven't you? Well, about 32 years, <laughs> Matt. About as long as you've been alive. <laughs> it's very kind. Now, that's just the face cream I use. I'm a bit older than that. <laughs> Um, so, hey, how did you start off in property? What was your... Uh... Well, I started when I was about 20, uh, working for a firm, uh, a firm of RICS surveyors, which included a, a residential agency and an auctioneer. So I had a, a pretty good grounding in, in sort of best practices yeah. uh, in, the, in that industry. And a lot has changed, I think, uh, over the years, mainly, I feel, uh, because of the heavy emphasis on... Uh, 
the commission driven model, which uh, I think doesn't always work mm-hmm. uh, in the best interests of the client. Yeah, no, it's, it's obviously moving on that. I mean, a, a standard, uh, you know, high street agent, they'll be, you know, will be charging what kind of commission to let and manage a property. Well, I think if you if you're talking, I mean, if you're looking at the major players within central London, you know, they are all making a move at the moment uh, to reinforce the value of their fees. I was talking to somebody yesterday who was a representative of the country's biggest. Uh, chain of estate agents who own a not, lot of well-known brands and they they talking to me when I was negotiating some fees for my clients they were talking how they've been on a course to to keep fees up and to increase okay. fees yeah. uh, because obviously they're in a very competitive marketplace in answer to your question I mean typically uh, an agent would look to charge 10% for the let only aspect of the of the transaction mm-hmm. and then that is obviously has VAT on top of that, so that works out uh, at 12, further twenty percent. Yeah, 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 on top of that, uh, and no residential landlord is going to be VAT registered, so you can't recoup that. And then, in terms of the management aspect of it, what they're looking to charge is anything from five percent to seven uh, percent plus VAT, which really um, into you know your, which is your a, yield, it's, if suppose, you're paying seventeen yeah. percent of your income, uh, including VAT, say as an average then that's quite a chunk. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you have to ask yourself the question uh, whether that's uh, you know, cost-effective and what service you're getting for that and whether, whether it's, uh, it's the best model to be looking at uh, to, to manage a property. For sure. So obviously property wealth management is, is quite a, um, I suppose a new idea in many ways and you're, you're trying to revolutionise the market. So how do, how do you different, differentiate yourself from... Uh, you know, the agents we've just discussed. What we do is we look at property as a long-term asset. Yeah. Uh, we charge a fixed monthly uh, fee per property, which typically is 60% less than the percentage model uh, preferred by estate agents. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reason we, we also have a 30-day notice, a reason we have a 30-day rather than an instant notice is you have to be able to hand over a property back to a client. So we don't look for any long-term lock-ins our, our, our ability to retain clients is based on the service we provide. And that uh, typically that fee, for example, for a studio flat would start in at £45 a month. Okay. Uh, it goes to 68 for a one bed, 88 for a two, 110 for a three, uh, and 132 for a four bed. Which, Above four yeah. beds, you know, we have a, uh, we, we will quote on the specific property. Sure. But the majority of rental properties in central London are, you know, one and two bed properties, some three beds, but the bulk of the demographic is in the two bed. It makes most sense to buy a two bedroom property because you, you can deal with professional sharers. You can deal with a couple who you know may want to be having a kid. You can deal with a, a couple who want a spare room. It's the broadest reach at the you know the best average price. Uh, and it's, it's a very fair system what you operate then because I mean you know let's say you know the agent on the street is charging uh, you know five percent let's say for the management um, you know obviously if that's at five hundred pounds a week uh, it's going to be a lot more than the, the flat if you can get one at two hundred pounds a week and yet really the service is the same but what you're saying is you're char- charging the same price I suppose whether or not you know it doesn't matter where it is in London is that yeah we don't have I mean you know our offices are are, are based here in Pont Street but that doesn't make us postcode snobs we've got we've got (laughs) properties in uh, Finsbury Park we've got properties in Putney Battersea uh, you know Nine Elms North Kensington Kensington Notting Hill um, you know and, and, and all points in between we were looking at some stuff in Hackney Haggerston the other day and, uh, you know, it's, it, there is not, you know, in these modern days, there isn't a geographic uh, concern. I mean, one thing that uh, we look at in terms of, uh, you know, what we, you know, apart from the price, you know, prices, price differential is great. If you're saving 60% on your management costs and you're one of those landlords that were thinking of doing it yourself, you can look at your time and decide that your one bed could be managed for £68 a month. Mm-hmm. And therefore, you know, it suddenly becomes a very different cost proposition and, you know, is much fairer, much more transparent. And, you know, there are no real hidden charges with that. I mean, we have a three point charging 
system. One is the membership, as we call it, because it sounds lovely and cuddly, and uh, which is a fixed monthly fee, again, with that 30 days notice. The other thing is if we do any works on the property for the client in the, in the, in the pursuit of managing it, we simply charge 10% on top of that. And uh, then, you know, if we have to attend the property, we have a simple £52 plus VAT attendance cost. Typically, a high street estate agent would, uh, in, in the areas we operate would charge between £100 and £120 for attending a property, uh, you know, in excess of their normal... So your clients are really getting good, good value. Yeah, I mean, we, what we look at is, is, uh, is it's, uh, you know, people ask us, you know, how can you charge those figures? And we would say, well, well let's turn that on your head. How on earth do you think the estate agents actually charge that? Because in our opinion, you know, they don't do a terribly good job. And I think if you, if your listeners are tenants or their landlords, uh, they will know or have ever been a tenant. They will know that really what the estate agency provides is a tenancy and tenant in the main. There's some very good people, but in the main is a tenant and tenancy issue. It's a reactive service that just looks at if there's a problem at the property, we need to react. And we need to send the plumber, the this, the yeah, other. Yeah. Now, the whole kind of our belief system and how we look at what we need to deliver for the client. I mean, we have uh, interviewed over 200 contractors. And if you like, you've got your smartphone in your pocket. You're a client of ours. You've got access to not only every contractor that you could possibly need for the management of your property, but also all the professionals that we okay. know, whether that be surveyors for your, your neighbor's building something, you need a party wall surveyor, whether that be a lawyer, whether it be somebody to deal with litigation because of leaks from a flat above, whether it's you know this, that and the other. If it gets beyond the point where we have been able to handle it because you're dealing with unreasonable people, we can furnish uh, our clients very quickly with a, with a big list of trusted professionals and your, your, your and clients become uh, your contacts become their contacts exactly right and that's a very valuable resource and a, a lot of uh, people I think in in who are either accidental landlords or or investors you know find themselves in a bit of a uh, you know a dysfunctional love triangle with the estate agent with the tenant and themselves and I don't believe that landlords themselves uh, wish to have their tenants treated uh, poorly. Uh, but I think there's a disconnect. And I think that just creates a, a, a non-virtuous circle mm -hmm. between that, what should be a more harmonious relationship. So at the core of what we do, uh, we believe in fight that in, to be successful as a landlord, you should uh, provide a well-run home for your tenants. And uh, that's not kind of, you know, this is not communism. This is just good business sense. Yeah, because at sure. the end of the day, uh, if you're, this is a home for your tenants. Even if you're an overseas investor, this is a home for your tenants. And providing a home, creating that environment where they feel nurtured and they're well looked after by people like ourselves, they stay longer and they, you have less voids, empty periods yeah, of your property, yeah. which so is the killer for a landlord. Trying to avoid, yeah, for sure. And you also are able to maintain a, a sensible level of rental going forward. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we look at uh, providing uh, a very proactive service because we give our clients an initial appraisal of the property. We advise them uh, of what, uh, you know, needs doing to the property to bring it to an optimum level. But that's, you know, that can be a, an incremental uh, situation of investment. We try to get our clients to look at investment, not cost. Uh, we had a situation the other day where I had a new client complaining to me because he had a 10-year boiler that had just finally given up the ghost. And I think because it was a reasonably large property, uh, he was facing a sort of two and a half thousand pound bill mm -hmm. for this replacement of this boiler. And he was very upset. Uh, you know, and this is happening on our watch. So he's looking at us saying, you know, almost as if we're to blame for the 10 year old boiler failing. And, uh, you know, we had a, a two and a half thousand pound estimate. And uh, he said to me, you know, I'm very unhappy about this. And I said, look, how long has the boiler been there? And he said, 10 years. So I said, we're talking 250 pounds <laughs> yeah. a year. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. I said, how much rent have you had in those 10 years? And he sort of started to smile. And I said, well, if we can get 10 years out of the next boiler, which 
Maybe it won't because I, do they build things like they used but, to? I don't know. Say seven now, don't they? Seven to well, ten. Which, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you can get, good. if you can yeah. look at that as an investment rather than a cost, mm-hmm. you know, you can't rent the property out without heating and hot water. So <laughs> you know, you know, if, I think it's probably against the law. So a ten it's, it, it's park, probably right? in that hundred and forty-two yeah. pieces of legislation we mentioned yeah. Uh, yeah. earlier. So the fact is, is that that uh, that client then really realised that actually change the chip, it's an investment. You know, I've got to do this if I want to be in the in the rental business. And you know, he felt better at the thought of having to replace his his uh, his boiler. Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of times it's putting it in perspective, and you, you obviously that you know very well. You, you mentioned about looking after people's investments and helping them them grow. So obviously that I mean, do you, you attend properties and maybe recommend how they can sort of refurbish it to get a better rent? It's actually absolutely sort of you, you absolutely just, right, and uh, you know our our. Uh, uh, we, you know, our, our views and our opinions, are, are, you know, are based on over 30 years experience, you know, with some development experience, pretty significant development experience working uh, in this market. And we, we understand, you know, what the market requires to get the optimum situation. Now, optimum doesn't necessarily mean the highest rent in this landing because the client may not wish to make that scale of investment. Yeah. Uh, you know, but the, and the two basic things in any properties are, are kitchens and bathrooms. Now, you know, we're not necessarily, uh, because we, we spend so much time talking to contractors, suppliers, things like this, so that we've always got the best pool of people for our clients. And, you know, a lot of estate agency businesses, uh, what they do is they operate with a one-stop shop supplier. So they will have a guy that their uh, management team can pick up the phone to, who'll do, does plumbing, does painting, does this, does, does every, he's a jack of all trades who basically subcontract that work in. Yeah, yeah. What we do is we try and hone down to find specialists in each area. The other thing we don't do is we don't take any commission or kickbacks from mm-hmm. the from the uh, contractors. Uh, that unfortunately is uh, uh, rife within the, in the, within the industry. And it's one of the things we don't like and we don't do because we have, we have a client, we're old fashioned and we service that client and we look after that client's interests. And that those codes of practice are why most of our business comes from lawyers, accountants, trust companies, private banks, that kind of thing. Uh, because at the end of the day, they understand, they operate with great deal of care to their clients, and we operate in you know to the highest code uh, that's possible. So the other thing that that does is when we're talking, if I'm interviewing you as a as a plumber or as a contractor, and I tell you very simply, we just use the phrase, we don't dip your pockets. And, you know, for honest tradesmen, they're really happy that they don't have to turn up with the brown envelope or discount the bill or do anything like that. That what they quote us is what they're going to get in their pocket. And we ask them, you know, rather than offering us something, you know, to just do the best price and the best job for our client. And, you know, sometimes we've interviewed people and, you know, the premise of their business is to be able to give some commission. And generally speaking, we can't work with those guys because they're pri- they've priced that into their job price. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, it's not going to be the best for us. And, um, you know, we, we're very conscious of being able to get a, a, a creative solution to problems that present themselves at properties. Well, I, I suppose as well, if you're doing, you know, so many you know, refurbishments for clients uh, now, and then you're probably getting a, a good market price because you're going back to the same contractors. So, you know, rather than, you know, I, I'm just, uh, you know, I own one property, I go to uh, a certain, you know, shop to get it, they're going to charge me a lot more than if I'm buying of 10. Course. So your I mean, you have economies of scale are, are very good, I would think. Also, you know, the nature of our business is we're in a, you know, we're always holding funds on behalf of the client. So if it's a minor job, we've got a float for each property. We know we're in funds. Once the job is done to satisfactory standard, we don't wait 30, 60 days to pay these people. We pay them swiftly. So, you know, and because usually we're working with owner managed businesses, you know, other than, you know, some of the large companies in the, in the fire and alarm businesses where we use some national names, you know, we usually have met the owner of that business. We make it a point of meeting the owner of that business and we've looked them in the eyes and they've sat in our office and we've interviewed them so that we know that we're dealing with like-minded people. So I think the the whole uh, ethos of how we do business is just all the way through. It's like a sticker rock. You know, you snap it, it's all the way through the middle of everything we do. And that's why we don't like the no win, no fee, yeah. commission orientated mm-hmm. model. We think the percentage game certainly on things like property management that's played by estate agents is outmoded. And really, 
as an example of that, if you're talking about unfair practices, I mean, for example, if I had a £300 a week flat in Pimlico, which is where I live, and you had a £3,000 a week house in Belgravia, which is basically Thanks where we're much. sat. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, well, that's okay. <laughs> I can see that you obviously, you're obviously ahead of the game. On that. <laughs> then I, I would see a situation where... If you look at the, if you look at the, the, the scenario that we have two tenanted properties, my 300 a week, yours is 3000, that the ballcock goes in a loo in each of our houses. Simultaneously, our tenants phone the managing at the same managing agent who sends the same plumber who does the same hundred pound job. I'm not suggesting a ballcock should cost a hundred pounds, but for sure, maths. Sure. Yeah, sure. A sake. So there's the same hundred pound job. Can you answer me why? you would pay 10 times more what I'm paying for the same service. And what is it you're receiving for that factor of 10? Oh. No, it might be three times, four times. Is this the plumber? No, that, that could have been the plumber on, on cue. Yeah, no, I hope but, not. Uh, yeah. the, the, you know, the bottom line is it's, 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 phenom- it's predominantly unfair. Yeah. Um, yet also, we negotiate... Um, uh, you know, we negotiate. We know we do work with agents and things like that, and and we use them. We harvest them really for our for our letting uh, process. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, one of the most important things is how do you get the property? If you're a landlord, yeah. you want a property with a tenant in it. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that our approach to management can save them money, deliver a better property, and manage the property up rather than down. Because anybody who's owned a property four or five years, they come back into it. And they look at it and they think, God, how has it got to this stage? Sure. And those people who were cooing about how wonderful it is are telling you that five years on, you've got to drop the rent, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. You're reading in the press how rents have gone up and you feel like you're the only person who's got a property that's worth less than it was five years ago. And the bottom line is, is because the industry managed it down, because the premise on which they are locked in to do business with you is that they get a great big lump sum fee 12 months in advance against the cash flow of your own yeah. And, you know, you're the interest of your client. With us, it's monthly. That's Some really clients choose to just pay us quarterly or six months. Really true, actually. I mean, I've rented a property you know, by an agent, and then you, you know, you get the you know, five pounds extra that that per week that year, and you think, oh, great. And then you 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 know you don't get the rent for the second until the second month because all your fees are just swallowed up straight away. So yeah, I guess the monthly thing in that sense, you know, helping your clients. Uh, well, on the management side, that's it. And I mean, sure. and on the letting side, what we do is we harvest on behalf of our clients the uh, the letting services of, of agents. So if if we will look at the property, look at the area, we will provide a uh, an overview of the best agents in that area by, uh, by factual achievement. And we will speak to those agents. We will have them value the property for rental. And we will uh, look to instruct them with our client's assistance to uh, to instruct one or two of those agents to get the property let. And what we typically do is we don't have a hard negotiation with them, but we typically get 20 to 30% mm-hmm. off their rates uh, that, that they would normally charge for letting. Uh, the process there is that we, uh, we act as a filter, you know, for our clients uh, that we're managing. And this is all part of our fee. We don't charge any extra for that. We certainly don't get any commission back from the agents. They receive exactly what's been negotiated. There is no, uh, sure, you just want no kind of hidden agenda with us. We just, yeah. we just get that. So typically, you know, the first stage is, you know, the property goes on. We get the particulars agreed. We then get an offer in. And, you know, typically, you know, people are obviously trying offers and things like that in the marketplace. So we negotiate the offers. We then present, you know, favorable offers to the client. So that they have they have a, an opportunity to to give their veto and their decision on that. If they if it's a go ahead, we then oversee the reference process to make sure that people are who they say they are, and that we m- limit as much as possible any risk uh, to our client of having a, a rogue tenant within their property. Uh, we then, if that's all passed, we then and that often can be a, 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 an example of a renegotiation. Uh, because we've had situations where the agent is telling us they're excellent references and we're saying they're not. Mm-hmm. And in, in that particular, in one particular example recently, we actually got the, the landlord 12 months rent in advance because these guys had savings, but they weren't very clever about being able to prove their income. Sure. And, um, you know, they all checked out in every other way. But through that negotiation post-referencing, we were able to secure our client 12 months uh, rent in advance be. because they wanted it. They had the savings, but, you know, they didn't, really have the the income and, yeah, and we, we talked to our client about this and you know we wrote a 12-month contract with the with the agents 
and the people pay 12 months in advance and happy days. Client was very happy. So we do the referencing. We then look at review the contract and then we handle the deposit and we handle the ongoing, the ongoing rental collection. So we have a, a streamlined, uh, we onboard the tenants, obviously, this, you know, once they're, you know, once they're in the properties. And we find that we say we save our clients a lot, awful lot of hassle. Yes, a lot of time. Uh, because time yeah, time, you, you know, if you, if, you're, the, you're the feet on the ground basically, and, and the the expert that's like I said, you're filtering, you know, the information for them to save them a lot of time, money, and stress. It sounds very similar to what I do for my clients. Well, it does. <laughs> you know, I only hope that, that we do it as well as you do for your clients. <laughs> but very, but the, very good. I think the thing is, the, the one last point on that is that. You know, if you're a landlord and you're sitting there with your one flat and it's empty and you've got on the other end of the phone somebody who's paid purely on commission and has a very low basic salary and a commission level and they're looking at your property being 12 months commission on that rental figure, there's quite a lot of incentive uh, to put you under pressure to accept offers. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a psychological switch between you as the client and then suddenly the money is introduced from the tenant. And I think people are left feeling slightly uh, abused in many, many ways, you know, in that in, in that relationship, because you do feel you can be made to feel like a bit of a dummy yeah. as to why you're not taking that offer. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, have and some of these guys can be more pressuring than others. And I, you know, have had that situation where I've had a sort of, you know, give them the walk away conversation because they're coming they're coming at us so strong to accept references, accept situations that we're not 100% happy with on behalf of our clients. We obviously then can present the best to the client. We don't want to lose a transaction, but, you I know. I think that's the important thing, isn't it? It's the client. And, you know, what you said is completely correct. When sometimes offers are presented, I often, you know, found, you know, some agents forget who their client is. And obviously totally. you're, you're working, obviously, for the landlords to, you know, act on their best benefit. And you're on the ground, you know the market, um, to sort of say, yes, this actually is the correct information, or it's not. Exactly. Um, and I mean, so you know, our, our, our charging structure is so simple and so transparent that there can be no uh, straying from that. You know, we constantly look. And the way we work is that by getting the property in tip-top condition in the best place it can be, by reacting to the problems, by being proactive and, you know, because planning is, you know, it's, uh, we all know that prevention is better than cure and that it's cheaper too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you know, by being, by planning and ensuring that the properties are better, in better condition, by paying attention to that, because what happens with an estate agent is they bolt on, it's a bit like, you know, apple pie and custard. You know, they've sold you the steak dinner. You've had that. And then they come along and go, would you like an apple pie and custard with that? Which is the management service. So they bolt that on to their set, to their letting service. I would have gone for it with apple crumble. Well, you could have had crumble. Okay, fine. You (laughs) you could have had ice cream, you know. But whatever the option is, the one menu, they bolt it on. And what happens is, you know, you could have a five-year window with three agents, you know, one doing 18 months, one doing two years, one doing 18 months. And, you know, you wouldn't use uh, a money uh, management company and swap them out every, every you know, you, if your property is a long-term fixed illiquid asset that needs a certain characteristic of management, of managing it up, because, you know, by use it deteriorates. So you need to keep gentle, simple, cost-effective fixes in the mix. And the thing is with that is, so they bolt on their service. But when the tenancy ends, the very time you need to be kicking kicking up a gear to get all those little things doing, they're walking away from that because they're focused on the next letting. And if the focus is on the next letting, you know, with us, the minute we get the 60-day notice, we're visiting the property within five days of that, you know, and we're going along and we're making a note of everything it is. To get it ready, One yeah. reason yeah. to deal with the dilapidations better, and I'll come on to dilapidations in a minute. And, and... And another one is is in in terms of the um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, yeah. Um, <laughs> what were we saying? The dilapidations. Are you sixty day notice? You were mentioning. Yeah, if you look at the sixty day notice, that's the time. That's the time you need to. That's the time you need to kick in and be be preparing to do the bits of work. You know, the days after those people think so it's market ready. So you've got the property property ready to go. Anyway, mm-hmm. for sure. Sorry, well, that, 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 that's okay. No, we've uh, yeah, we've actually had a very good chat there. And I think if anyone's been been listening, um, you can see that managing a property is not just taking that phone call at three in the morning to to fix a boiler. Is it? It's there's a whole lot more uh, to it. So. Uh, thanks for your time today. Well, how can anybody get in contact uh, with with you? Um, well, to the, ask any 
other questions that they may have. I mean, our, our own. Do you want my phone policy? number? Or well, the... you can, whatever you like, Alice. So the website okay. is? Uh, the website is www.propertywealthmanagement.com. And yeah. our office number is 0207-129-1282. Okay. And uh, my email address is robert at propertywealthmanagement.com. So, Fantastic. Uh, oh. There's so much more to it, but uh, you know, give us a call. We've been cut short. We have, sorry about that. We've, uh, but uh, yeah, so we have to get all the, Robert's details will be um, on the UK Health Radio website. So thanks for your time, Robert, today. And Pleasure. maybe we'll come back and do another show another time. Right? No, we will. Other half. Thank you very Take much. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, so thanks for tuning in again today. Um, next week, uh, it's a slightly different show. I'm taking the show abroad with me again. Um, I'm going to be in uh, the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, in Dubai. Um, the property market in Dubai has, uh, I think, it's been open since about 2001, since uh, non-locals uh, could buy property. So obviously, it's matured a little bit since back then, but we're going to find out uh, who's buying, uh, how to buy, and uh, how the market is. So uh, look forward to speaking to you next week. That's Matt Turner of The Property Show on UK Health Radio.